Spencer, thank you so much for being here and taking time out of your busy schedule. I know that you're at home right now. So can you just tell me who you are, where you come from, uh, who are your people and what is your land? <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Dorothy. Uh, my English name, my given name is Spencer Greening. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from the, the Tsimshian people also known as the Simshian on the northwest coast of BC specifically. I come from the Gitgat First Nation or the Gitkata tribe of Tsimshian people. My Tsimshian name is Lahore. And uh, I, I belong to the, the Raven clan of, the, of our people. And uh, our territory sort of inhabits uh, the, the coastal area of northwest British Columbia and uh, runs into the inland, the, the rivers, the tributaries, um, the coastal mountains. And so because of this terrain, we, uh, we are an ocean going and salmon people, but we also have plenty of stories and roots and ties to the inland, um, specifically around the Skeena River area. And, uh, and so the name Tsimsien, means from within the Skeena. And it, it tells of how our people came out of that place. And uh, at, at one time we migrated out of there, or, or many of our lineages did, some did not, but many did. And uh, our, our identity is of that, of that area. And so uh, we're a coastal uh, peoples who uh, salmon and, and the, the coastal waters, the ocean, make up a large part of our our identity, our economy, our spirituality, and our governance. I also happen to be a PhD student at SFU, Simon Fraser University. That's great, and I really am happy that you're here and that you're able to talk to me about that, because that was my next question is, uh, tell me about your PhD journey to SFU. How did you get here? Where did you do your BA and your MA? So I started um, my sort of academic career at the University of Northern British Columbia because it was closest to home. And there I got into Indigenous studies, um, political science, history, and I really got fired up. On, on what I could do for my people, uh, starting to understand the bigger picture of indigenous politics in the world today and identity and culture. And so I ended up doing a master's in, in anthropology, but it was essentially interdisciplinary studies on indigenous governance. And that revolved around this conversation of, uh, if we look at indigenous governance and laws on the coast, there's a very, strong hereditary system that has chieftainships, uh, lineages, um, territories that are very um, uh, carved out, very pronounced and carved out and throughout uh, the coast. And, and uh, as I was learning more about that, I wanted to have the dis discussion of what does it mean for me, as someone who comes from a lineage that comes from that place and has these governance laws and territory, how does that contrast to my own identity and, and sort of political identity um, uh, with this idea that I grew up with that I was just like an Indian act Indian. I just had a status card and therefore I was an Indian. And so I, I started to look at that conversation from a governance perspective. And, uh, and at that time, I also was elected to leadership for my um, nation, elected leadership for my nation, and got more into politics and governance. And, and it led me to have these great conversations with people who um, I, uh, I care about deeply, family members, hereditary leaders throughout our entire nation, on having this discussion of what does it mean to be a part of a lineage and engage in governance and law in our communities, as opposed to just being an Indian under the Indian Act from a band, band council on the reserve. 
and so there there was just um it opened my eyes to a, a bigger way of understanding our relationship with law and governance and, and in time yeah such a huge tension right between those yeah. two systems and so the tension that spoke out loudest to me was how we start to understand stewardship of land because so many of our laws our governance system is tied to the land and so the tension that comes up is what we find is as an indian act band council we're just butting heads with our neighbors all the time whether it's in treaty whether whether it's in industry um, resource management anything like that but as a in a hereditary system in it, it's much more fluid in the a process of negotiation and agreement is just laid out better and so that sort of piqued was my that, interest is that what you did your master's in like looking at all of that while you were well, that sort of, a counselor at the time i uh, i was just trying to have the conversation in my master's of comparing the two systems oh okay and so as i got more interested in the stewardship piece um, it slowly turned into uh, traditional ecological knowledge, resource management research that I was doing on the side of, uh, uh, alongside being a band counselor and engaging in politics and, and, um, and environmental assessments and in, the, in court cases and all these, this heavy sort of legal time of pipelines, natural gas, oil, that was all coming up. And so... So my interest slowly started moving towards the governance of the land of territory. And that's where my PhD comes in. And how it came up was there was a whole whack load of proposed pipelines and um, tanker routes in our territory. And the elders said, you just need to get as much information about this one sacred watershed as you can because it's where we were born and raised that was like our home as children we were born in the smoke houses there we were brought up in the language just in the fluid culture and and they just kept on hammering that and i just thought well how how about we turn this into a phd where i could just tell the story of what does thousands and thousands of years of stewardship of this place look like and how does that apply to management of ecosystems traditional ecological knowledge and how we should protect these ecosystems in the face of industrial development or how do we look at co-management which is what the government likes to talk about a lot and that's what brings me to my phd where i'm essentially telling the story about this watershed so you're starting to link stories from the land with the land. Absolutely. And the key part that I really like to talk about in this thesis is that any of our governance in our laws, our, 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 our politics, our governance structure in the laws that make that structure um, come from the stories that were passed down from our ancestors who inherited it from the land and when i say from the land it could have been beings on the land it could have been animals it could have been fish it could have been uh, an array of things and so often in my thesis i try to have this conversation that we as humans um, we don't sort of get to decide this legal sovereignty on place we are like the most vulnerable being here so we got to listen to our elders and often our elders are the salmon they're the mountain goats they're the bears they're the mountains they're the beings the spiritual beings who have inhabited this place since time immemorial and so those are the people who have given us humans the laws and so i sort of have that conversation while telling the story of this place well that's great because i mean I don't know whether you can discuss uh, the your traditional structure, you know, because I know when I was up in the Hazelton Gitskan 
area get scanned with Sowetan. And I did a couple of productions with the hereditary women chiefs when Delgamuk was happening. So they gave me some idea of just how complex the clan relationships are. You know, and I remember thinking at the time, um, you know, it's like we as Indigenous peoples are painted as such simplistic people, right? But it's like when you get into the true understanding of how that Indigenous knowledge interrelates with the land and all the beings, you get to see how sophisticated it is, right? And, and plus, I mean, it's so simple to other people, but it's very profound, right? Yeah. You know, so is that what you're writing about? Is that what you're getting into? Like th that For sure. level? Yeah. And I, I like to sort of, sometimes when I explain that structure to people, I say, you can imagine the Canadian legal system where there's the federal government, the provincial government, municipalities, and representatives who sort of uh, bring bills to the table to create new laws and things. Well, if you imagine often coastal peoples, our territories are carved up into different lineages that almost look like provinces. Yeah. And each of those carved territories are governed by a lineage who have such a long history there that they've developed and passed their own bills and of law, their own laws. And so in one part of our territory, let's say there's a certain channel where there's this being who lives under the water. We call them Nachnoch in our language. And we've had to listen to that being and take note of it and incorporate what they've told us to do into our law. And sometimes that'll be portrayed by um, crests on our, our, um, on our regalia, tattoos, it might be pictographs or petroglyphs, but that will just apply to that one territory because that's where that being is. And so it's this very uh, local, but very grounded approach to law. And, and so I, I'm speaking to this one place, but my hope is that this message will sort of resonate to everywhere in that the land holds such a deep, knowledge about how to live with it how us humans are meant to live with the land and if you look to our stories and you look to our ceremonies um, you can find those hints of just genius that tell us how to live in this place yeah and that's the gist of it yeah that, i mean that brings up a really good point that because i worked with land and story in my phd dissertation as well and I was allowed to um, actually use one um, coyote story, Sinclair story. Uh, Dr. Ronnie Ignace uh, gave me permission to use this story in its whole form. And it was in Chapup McSteen with English uh, subtitles, right? Translations. So when I got it all done at the very end uh, and I was handing it in, I spoke to my supervisor and I said, I need to put a caveat at the beginning of this dissertation, you know, in that I know the university confers copyright to me, you know, on this work. I said, however, I cannot claim copyright on any of the Indigenous knowledge that was shared with me. And that, for instance, that uh, Sinclair story that I used, it belongs to the Shaquapmik Nation mm -hmm. as a collective. And I had other um, Indigenous knowledge keepers from the Haida, the Seneca, the Cree, Métis, 
So I just extended that to all those nations as well. I said that I did not claim copyright of any of their knowledge, that the, that sits with the originating nation and that if anyone wanted to use that, they had to get in touch directly with the nation. You know, so I remember Joanne Archibald was my supervisor, right? And and I remember talking to her about this and she said, nobody's ever done that before. <laughs> and I said, well, let's try it and see, right? Yeah. And I put it at the very beginning of my dissertation and we handed it in and it went through, you know, nice. grad and postdoctoral yeah. studies. You know, because it's like we we ourselves have to learn how to be respectful, not just of our own knowledges, but knowledges of other people, right? You know, and, and I mean, I worked in the film and television industry for a number of years, and I remember it was such a... Um, it was, I don't know how I can explain that. It was a tension I carried with me all the time. You know, when I was going into all these other nations, communities, and sharing some of their stories. But it was contemporary stories, like I wasn't asking them ancestral stories, right? You know, yeah. so, yeah. But it, it's like, when you get into the complexities of all of that, like I like to think that we are returning to some semblance of indigenous diplomacy <laughs> mm -hmm. of how to conduct ourselves you know with each other as well as with the land and all the beings on the land so what's yeah yeah what stage are you at in your phd process i'm currently writing so just finishing up uh yeah up the thesis finishing up writing uh, well uh my hope is to be finished writing by december this coming year oh but, good it's good that until, you're allowing yourself a whole all that time because yeah yeah i know and, that. and sprinkled amongst that timeline are many trips i hope to take out on the land because a part of this work is actually living it in and being a part of what I talk about, because one of the things I'm sort of eternally frustrated with in academia is how much we talk about things as opposed to live things. And when we talk about the land specifically, the only real way to get to know it is to be with it, to, to be on it, to live with it. And, uh, and so, yeah, I've incorporated that into my timeline and also into my to what I write about. There are many parts of my thesis where there'll be autoethnography of me talking about my own experience of what does it mean to go um, to do ceremony, to fast in order to go hunt a mountain goat? And where does that come from? So that's a conversation I have in my thesis. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, you're talking about the embodiment right of our laws and our yeah. way of, our ways of doing no because i know i i did that in my masters uh because i was using this work from a maori man who had passed on and i you know it's like my way was usually to go and present a gift and tobacco and talk to the people and let them know what i was doing and to get permission, right, to use to use their work. But Barry Barkley had died already, you know, so it's like I thought I, the way that I managed that was I went up the mountain and I fasted, you know, for the right to use his work, you know. But mm -hmm. while I was up there, I was also talking to him, right? <laughs> just, yeah. just explaining, you know, what I was doing. Absolutely. There's this part um, in my thesis that I want to get to uh, I really explain well, and that's for Indigenous people, uh, I, methodology can engages in the spiritual world. 
And if, if you were to just sort of back up and ask, well, what is methodology? Essentially it is just how are we going to go get information? And our methodology might be going to the archive and digging through old journals. Well, for indigenous people, if we wanted to go get information, like Spencer wants to go uh, get information on where he should go hunt mountain goats or where he should go for whatever reason, a tangible way to do that for indigenous people was engaged in the spiritual. And so I talk about fasting as well. And so we go to the fasting ceremony to access knowledge from a certain place. And for us, we're accessing that knowledge from the spirit world. And so for me, I present that as uh, the valid methodology to do before going mountain goat hunting and how that within that are also built, uh, also within that are stewardship conservation laws built into the act of hunting. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad you bring that up because that sort of spiritual methodology is, is just another way to access knowledge or get information. And I've, uh, one of my mentors ha has explained the same thing where he cites an interview happening in the spirit world while he was fasting. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is so cool, right? Because when I talk about my work and the complexities of indigenous not, uh, methodologies or ways of doing is much more complex, right? In terms of our accountabilities and responsibilities that we hold towards that knowledge that we are asking for, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I talk about my dreams as a part of my methodology. You know, because when I was in my PhD, I was in my writing phase and I was feeling really um, asking myself, do I have the right to be talking about this? And it goes beyond, you know, what everybody calls the imposter syndrome. You know, it, it was my people, right? It's like the genetic connection to the land. It was like all those things were in here in turmoil, right? Mm -hmm. And during my writing process, I was lucky enough to have a writing retreat while I was house sitting for this elder woman friend. And she had a house that looked out on the Coast Salish Sea. Mm -hmm. So I was able to write from there and, and have eagles do, do flybys every day. You know, and when I was there and, and really in this turmoil with myself, I got really, really tired. And I finally, I just said, just lay down and go to sleep. Right? So I slept for three hours, solid sleep. But my great uncle came to me in a dream. And it was a really long dream. And at the very end, he said to me, you go over there and write that down and show those people. <laughs> you know, so to me, that was like, okay, I can go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Totally. Yeah. And I mean, that's a practice that's been done for millennia. Exactly. By our people. Exactly. But the thing that I, t I talked a little bit about this in my dissertation. I mean, I was raised to uh, what I was told was not to share those things with people. Yeah. Right. It's like, keep it to yourself because it's yours. Right. Mm -hmm. but, and that was another area in this PhD writing. It was a huge turmoil about should I do this or not? And you know, all this kind of stuff. So I had a good long talk with um, Ronnie Ignace, you know, and, and the way he talked to me about it was, it's like the performative action of what you receive through the dream world or through fasting, right? When you go up the mountain. 
And I thought, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> you know, so it's the performative part of that, right? And I also yeah. rationalized it by saying that I'm not harming anyone, mm -hmm. right? It's knowledge direction that came to me, whether it was through fasting or through dream. And my sharing it is not hurting anyone, right? It's not harming yeah. anyone. So then I was okay with it, right? You know, but I mean, I think we're talking about something that your Western education institutions don't know how to wrap their minds around because they're all about mind, right? They spirit doesn't make its presence known in your Western knowledge, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, I hope, conversations and research like this can change change that uh overall conversation because as humans i don't think there's ever been a time in our history that we've been so disconnected from everything else other than our mind mm -hmm. and it, it sort of shows where we're headed as a society with overconsumption, over industrialization, how we're treating the planet. And um, maybe little conversations like this can help. I mean, I, I can reflect on my own experience where I was to, taught to hunt through dreaming and how that just opened up my eyes to a way of being that was different than what I was raised with or sort of knew as a kid. And so, yeah, hopefully these conversations and these stories can just open up many eyes and see that, hmm, if this was sustainable or if this just worked for millennia, it's not like people would hold on to something useless for millennia. <laughs> they would hold on to <laughs> very good things. It would be a very good thing if they felt like keeping it there and keeping it sacred for thousands of years. It would not be useless to society. Well, in the other part, I think, you know, when you're getting into stewardship and uh, I think about how Western knowledge systems think about science, right? And I mean, I know old men in my family, you know, and in the community who observed, right? I mean, they observe over years and years of how things happen on the land, right? And and maybe yeah. they don't they don't write it down and keep data, <laughs> but they they certainly know about what has effect on the land, right? Yeah. You know, so it's it's interesting. So that's why I'm I'm so happy to be able to talk to you because I think that the work that the Indigenous grad students are doing are gifts to the university and in fact gifts to the world, right? Because it's like you're presenting a new way of thinking, a new way of being, a new way of relating, right? And you're talking about the, the whole of how we are to be on the land. Right. So tell me what you're doing up north right now. So a part of my uh, thesis is going to uh, analyze all the place names of that watershed, that sacred watershed I was talking about and um, and sort of analyze them and see the stories and the teachings that place names give. So a part of telling the story of stewardship and traditional ecological knowledge of a place is language and place names. And so that's going to be a chapter in my thesis. And so upon analyzing the, the, the place names, um, I've identified about 61 or so in this uh, river watershed. Uh, you can really see how they hold different meanings and some um, refer to 
oral histories very specifically in, in some refer to traditional ecological knowledge and are just sort of like maps on how to live in this place and how to live on the land. But regardless, there's this deep meaning within them that were just spoken about and just sort of known as opposed to um, how maps are made today and how places are described today in the English world. And so, yeah, that, that I'm working on that this week with several fluent elders. And then come the weekend, I'll be flying down to my village and going into the territory. And I'll be um, doing some mountain goat work where I'll be out on the land assessing mountain goat populations, um, checking out one of our key mountain goat harvest sites and also doing my own processing. There's um, a beautiful area there where we do cold water bathing in the winter. And so I'll be doing some of that as a, the ritual lead up to a mountain goat harvest. Mm -hmm. And so all that is tied into some of the work. So I'll be spending a week um, sort of disconnected from the digital world, reconnecting with the mountain goat world. Uh, yeah, for the next little yeah, while. I appreciate you making time for this digital connection <laughs> while you're up there. <laughs> Now, just to talk about academia a bit more, I understand that you're a Trudeau scholar. So when did you get that scholarship? I was awarded the scholarship in 2018. Um, that would have been my second year as a PhD student. Okay. And what would you say, because people look to that scholarship as pretty prestigious, you know, and I'd like to ask you, what would you say to other Indigenous grad students who are considering applying for that scholarship? I would say the people that you meet um, who have also been awarded the Trudeau Scholarship are, are everyone who has, has been given that prestige there they're all like amazing, thoughtful, wonderful people. And so you build this community in a way that is, it's, it's just a beautiful way of building academic community. But there's this other side for indigenous students to this sort of academic prestige world. Um, I found that with that award and with the demands that come from it, you're being tasked with more things that remove you from your community. And so I just don't, I, this is another gripe I genuinely have of me tell, being honest. This is Spencer being honest that I don't really know, aside from monetary value, how much it actually gives you your community. Like it, it, it gave me an immense amount of, of, of support, monetary support and scholarship support to do this valuable work in my community. But could that work actually have been done had I just went back home and done it and not done the PhD? Absolutely, it could have been done. And I probably would have had more time in my community and more time with the youth in my community passing this knowledge on. And so academia just presents a double-edged sword. And so this is me just being perfectly honest to people who, um, who are looking to, to engage in this work, to be aware of it. Um, there, it. It comes with bureaucracy that I don't know if Indigenous people are meant to be a part of. I, don't, I, I think the, our energy is just better spent in other places. And so, <laughs> I, I mean, I might... I don't, I also don't want to sound like I'm unappreciative because it, it truly is an honor to be recognized on that scale that this is one of Canada's um, greatest awards you can get as a PhD student in the social sciences. And so on some level, the Trudeau Foundation, uh, the government is recognizing that Indigenous knowledge is not only valid, but it needs to be at the forefront of the conversations that are changing our society, which is, that's amazing in itself. But the actual system that this sentiment exists in 
still doesn't do that much for us as indigenous people. Well, I think you're and, getting at something here. I mean, because we're functioning within a colonial institution. We have to always remember that, right? And I wrote about this in my dissertation as well, when I talked about walking on that, the very fine edge of that sword, because not only do we have to know the Euro-Western thinking in the area that we're looking at, but we also have our own area, you know, of indigenous knowledge. So it's like, we have to do double work, <laughs> right? You know, so, yeah. yeah. The standard sort of, um, uh, how to, the, the standard way of producing a thesis is kind of like, you go to a place, extract that knowledge and you write about it. But for indigenous people, specifically indigenous people studying their own communities, it's you go to that place, you have to live in that place, you have to make an agreement to be responsible and tied to that place for your lifetime and uphold all these social responsibilities indefinitely and then check in with the ethics of the university as well as the ethics of your own community and your own family ties, plus uphold any external responsibilities to which anyone could probably speak to based on their own culture. But for me, it would be like with a knowledge holder, you become a public speaker, you become a speaker for hereditary chiefs, you become a master of ceremonies for potlatches. You do all these other things that academia does not recognize. Yeah. And frankly, I feel like all of those things are way more important than publishing a paper or going to a conference or doing these things that are kind of the extras for your average student pursuing post-secondary education. Yeah. And this is something that I don't think scholarships fully recognize. I don't know if institutions fully recognize they're starting to, but let's say uh, if we go up for tenure as a, a, as a professor, will they look at Spencer and say, oh, he's been the master of ceremonies for 10 potlatches. Let's consider that. I don't know if they'll do that. No, I mean, I wish they would say outright. Systems are just beginning to be looked at, you know, because it's complicated, of course, by the fact that there are four unions at the university, you know, so those, it's like you have to go through all that interrelationship in terms of the bureaucracy, right? Because then on top of the double work that we do, it's like the emotional labor, I think, that's put on us as Indigenous scholars, the expectation for us to teach non-Indigenous peoples, right? And, and I know that I was so frustrated during my PhD program, there was this one young man who happened to live in the apartment below me, and he was also a PhD student at UBC and he would he was doing research up in um, Hartley Bay area and uh, he kept coming to me and asking me things about how to you know approach and how to get access and finally one day I said to him so what are you going to give me in return are you going to give buy my coffee? Are you going to buy me a dinner? And he never did any of those things. You know, and, and I mean, he was the epitome of white privilege, you know, in my mind. You know, so needless to say, I just stopped responding to his emails because he just didn't get it, right? And I mean, I, I was pretty direct to with him right and um yeah it's like there isn't a very good understanding of reciprocity it's just an expectation yeah i think the key difference here is um mainstream society because it's coming from such an individualistic place it interprets this yes as greed or like as 
payment. Yeah. When reality, what this comes from is a place of relationship building and um, a place of commitment to each other. Yeah. That if I've got your back, you've got my back. Yeah. And that sort of commitment happens all the time. At least in my neck of the woods, I see it from like day to day ground level stuff to huge sort of overarching political laws and governance structures in place yeah. that ensure that relationship building exists every step of the way. Yeah. And that is, is kind of hard to understand when coming from an individualistic place. Yeah. And uh, I, I, hopefully at some point, every university can sort of find ways to, to honor and, and bring that relationship building into the equation. Well, I think we're living in a time, because you're touching on something that's really critical, I think, at this time, in this very moment in history, you know, when you're looking at the pandemic that we've been living in, we're going into the third year of it. And when you think about the floods and the fires that have just happened in this past year and how it's changing things, physically changing the terrain, right? And so people are being forced to look at how do we get through this as a collective, right? Yeah. How do we make sure that we have a place for our kids or grandkids so that, you know, they have a place after we're gone? So I, I think that that's one of the things the universe is calling for, you know, in terms of, yeah. you know, looking at, you know, because I keep, since COVID started, I keep asking people, what do you think the universe is trying to tell us? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, it, it, it comes, I mean, there's some recognition because Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous voices have never been as recognized as they are now. But the act of recognizing them is complex when it carries this colonial history. Uh, but it, it is clearer than day. Like we need to look to the land and listen to it and follow ancestral laws on how to be in this place because we have dug ourselves into a hole as a mainstream society um, that we're kind of flailing in. Absolutely, I agree. And I think that's a beautiful place to finish. Thank you so much for your knowledge and for sharing it and for being generous to share your experiences and your thoughts, you know, and, and um, where do you see yourself going from here? You're going to go back to your people, right? And, and work there. Yeah, I, um, my goal is the next steps are to, I, I would like to write a book, um, as like something to honor the knowledge uh, and make that accessible to people. Um, not only my own people, but also the people who might want to think about living with the land differently, as you mentioned, especially in these times of, of, uh, of craziness, uh, climate change, weather, natural disaster. So I want to do that and I'm, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that my life will keep me working with my community and I'm passionate about influencing policy and law, but also protecting territories. And so whatever, fa uh, whatever path allows me to do that best. I just realized that I forgot to ask you a nosy question because there, I'm sure there'll be all these single women out there saying, I wonder if he's single. <laughs> Does he have brothers or sisters? I forgot to ask that at the beginning. <laughs> That's great. I mean, I think it's uh, very appropriate on, on in the context of this conversation and podcast 
Um, I am not single. I am with, have a wonderful partner who's doing wonderful, amazing work in, in this in this life as well. And and and, and I have a brother who isn't single either. And he, yeah. <laughs> and he's what's he doing? He's in law, right? Yeah, he's a lawyer. He's he's yeah. currently working as a lawyer. He finished his law degree a year or two ago. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you for sharing that. Cause that'll take care. <laughs> it's like all kinds, of I'm sure. So, <laughs> so we can end on that good note. 